Okay, welcome back everybody to our uh, day, uh, the second day of our conference. So today is going to be a pretty um, intense day. We will uh, have five sessions. Uh, some sessions will have two speakers, others will have one speaker. Uh, so I'm, today we will start with uh, a paper by Jean and Elias Watney. So I will introduce uh, Jean first. So Jean was awarded his PhD from Warwick and Monash in 2019 and is currently lecturer in philosophy at Monash University. He is interested in the relation between German idealism, contemporary analytic metaphysics, and critical theory. He is currently working on a book on the concept of indifference in Hegel's logic. The title of his paper today is Indifference in and Against the Idea from Mechanism to uh, Method in the Science of Logic. So, Jean, whenever you're ready. Please. Thanks very much, Philip. I just want to um, thank the conference organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to uh, participate remotely and for persisting with this conference in spite of all the difficulties and hardships. I really um, appreciate it. It's very impressive uh, dedication and commitment to the Hegelian cause. So my talk today is a slice of this book project on Hegel's concept of indifference or his uh, indifference critique. I'll just start my timer. Um, so to stick with the slice metaphor, because the book is not yet fully cooked, been working on it for a couple of years, this slice might be a little runny at the edges. It's certainly in danger of spilling over the 25 minutes, so I'll have to talk a little quicker than I would like. Um, but I'm very interested in feedback um, on the line of thinking that I'm pursuing here. So just to provide some context, uh, two of Hegel's most important targets in ethics and politics, respectively, are each criticised as defective on account of indifference in some way. So in ethics, Stoicism is criticised as indifferent to the world. Uh, and in politics, Hegel's critique of liberalism is put in terms of its figuring individuals as atoms indifferent to one another. Now, interestingly, indifference is also central to Hegel's critique of both Schelling and Spinoza's metaphysics. So Schelling's identity philosophy uh, collapses all determinate qualitative difference into indifference and as such, uh, as such is unable to provide an explanatory principle for qualitative difference. And behind these critiques of Schelling's identity philosophy is a critique of Spinoza's substance metaphysics, of course. And so James Krannis's Reason in the World, a book I'll be talking about quite a bit today, reconstructs Hegel's critique of Spinoza in the logic in terms of indifference. Uh, it's there in the text itself, but um, Krannis draws it out insofar as substance is indifferent to its expression in mode and attribute. So to give an introductory gloss on the concept of indifference before I go any further, Indifference isn't sheer indeterminacy, so characteristic of pure being and pure nothing at the start of the logic. It's, if I can put it this way, a more determinate form of indeterminacy that obtains when self-relating terms are set in external relations to one another. And that results in, as I say there, qualitative indiscernibility. Now, in all cases, Hegel claims that the structural presence of indifference in the account of a given domain, practical or theoretical, results in a self-undermining loss of explanatory power. That's the idea of an indifference critique. Now, indifference reappears across the logic, first in the dialectic of something and other, then the existence chapter, then in the quantity section, then in the transition from being to essence as absolute indifference in the critique of Spinozism I've just mentioned and elsewhere. It's pretty much everywhere once one starts looking for it. Um, the most relevant instance of indifference in the logic for my purposes today is mechanistic objectivity, is for what I'll be focusing on. So uh, Hegel is a systematic philosopher. Right? He's, he's arguably the philosopher who most fully submitted to the demands of systematicity, which is why we all love him. And so it's unlikely that the overlap between the vocabulary of indifference in metaphysics and its mobilization in practical context is coincidental, especially given Hegel's criticism of Kant as figuring the relationship between theoretical and practical sides of philosophy as indifferent to one another. But I can't provide a systematic account of indifference across Hegel's work in the 25 minute paper as much as I would love to. So what I wanna to do today is make one very general point, and perhaps it's an obvious one, I think ultimately it might be an obvious one, about how the objectivity and ideas sections of the concept logic figure indifference and non-indifference. 
So in the objectivity and idea sections, as most here will know, Hegel's argument moves from the external relationality and concomitant indifference that characterizes mechanistic objectivity through the sublation of external purpose and the appropriative activity of the living organism. And it culminates in the idea understood as absolute or universal method. Such a method is not independent of and indifferent to that which it organizes or systematizes, um, but rather renders explicit the relevant principle of self-organization or self-determination in its object. Now, as Karen Ng has recently made clear in her incredible book, Hegel's Concept of Life, crucial throughout um, Hegel's articulation of the idea is his Aristotelian understanding of form is not externally imposed on matter, but rather as the imminent organizing principle of the matter itself. And Ng is right to note that this account, this Aristotelian account of form matter uh, relation means in turn that Hegel is going to be critical of external relations in which the relata are mutually indifferent to one another. So we have in Hegel a normative distinction between the idea and indifference as defective in some way. And arguably, I'm starting to think this might be the normative distinction in Hegel's work. So in terms of the paper today, the first part is going to unpack the structure of indifference and the idea and their normative opposition, A, B, and C, in a little more detail. Then I want to problematize in the second part this simple opposition. So Hegel is aware that, of course, um, perhaps more than anyone, that criticizing external relationality from the presupposed standpoint of the idea would itself be an instance of external imposition. So here, as usual, Kant's philosophy is for Hegel exemplary of the kind of dualism that makes an impositionist account of the relationship between conceptuality and objectivity or the unconditioned and the conditioned inevitable. That won't necessarily make sense right away, but I'll go through it in a bit more detail later. And the challenge in the last part of this paper is to outline the relationship between the idea and indifference in a dialectical rather than a dualistic way, such that self-determination is not itself indifferent and external to indifference. And here I take Reason in the World by um, James Krinus to be really important, though I think it's in need of supplementation. Okay, so on to mechanistic indifference. I've talked about this before, um, so I'm a little bored of it, and I might rush it uh, for that reason, but just to lay out mechanistic indifference. Um, the mechanical account of objectivity takes each object to be purely self-identical. So in the logical progression, um, the mediation of the syllogism has collapsed into immediate identity. Uh, in this self-identity, the object mechanically conceived excludes all other objects from itself. Now we know from all the way back in the existence chapter of the logic um, that qualitative determinateness is dependent upon contrastive comparison, we might say. So minimally that between reality and negation. So reality is what it is by not being negation and vice versa. So the mechanical object turns out to be indeterminate in two ways. Firstly, in its self-identity, it has no determinate opposition within. So it has no internal complexity or perhaps more properly, it lacks a constitutive moment of self-difference. Now, as a result of this, Hegel says, and this is the first quote there, the mechanical object points for its determinateness outside and beyond itself, constantly to objects for which it is, however, likewise a matter of indifference that they do the determinant. So lacking a determinacy of its own, the object is dependent upon other external objects for its determinacy. But because these objects are also conceived that it's purely self-identical and so indeterminate, we have no grounds for qualitative distinction outwardly. So indeterminate both inwardly and outwardly. We have this contradictory or unstable combination of difference. So this object is not that, diff uh, that object and identity. This object is the same as that object insofar as both are identically self-identical. So for Hegel, this is the second quote coming up, determinism is a philosophical standpoint that illegitimately universalizes a mechanistic conception of objectivity. So in the determinist uh, picture, we account for qualitative determination by a mere order or arrangement and external combination of diverse parts. Um, so I won't read out the quote, but what Hegel is doing here is spelling out um, the explanatory deficiency, ultimately the explanatory emptiness that we run into if the mechanistic or deterministic picture rather is taken to be the truth of objectivity, it's taken to be absolute. 
Um, now, the German for indifference is really important here, Gleichgültigkeit or equal validity. Because objects are indifferent to one another, one can stop one's explanation at any object, right, or move on to the next would-be explainer object here serving as explainer. And these options are equally valid or indeed invalid. So we're left, as Hegel claims in the uh, paragraph after this one, with this infinite oscillation and external back and forth movement, insofar as the object is determined by another object and different from itself and vice versa and so on uh, indefinitely. So this normative distinction between an external, well, sorry, the normative distinction that I want to talk about between external indifference, which is on full display at the beginning of the mechanism chapter, and self-determination characteristic of the idea is present from the very start of the idea section. And in fact, it's how the idea is introduced. So in introducing the idea, Hegel makes um, two claims. The first is that the, the, the idea is the canon of truth, right, or the criterion of truth. Um, the idea is the adequate concept, the objectively true, the true as such. Things have truth only insofar as their idea. I think most of us here will be familiar with the specific sense of truth in play here, but just to clarify, um, so Robert Stern draws our attention very helpfully to Heidegger's distinction between propositional and material truth in, um, on the essence of truth. Um, so a propositional truth would be the correspondence of judgments over here with states of affairs over there. And this is a bit distinguished from material truth, sacrifice, the correspondence of objects with their essence, nature or concept. Right? And it's clear that Hegel's got the second in mind. Um, when he gets to the idea, I'd love to talk about how the first uh, section of the concept logic shows that any propositional model of truth has to is ultimately dependent on material truth, but I can't go into that. Anyway, as Robert Pippin and Karen Ng and James Cranus all note, and Heidegger notes much earlier, the material conception of truth is indicated in ordinary language when we say things like a true act of friendship, a true human being, a true work of art, and so on. So the act, the agent, or the object accords with its concept or what it ought to be. Uh, and this is linked of course, to Hegel's sense of actuality, which doesn't mean simply an actualized or actualizable real possibility, but a thing's being in accordance with what it ought to be, and so idea. Um, so as Pippin and Ning both point out, we can equally say a real friend, a genuine artwork, actual hospitality, and so on. So the contrary for Hegelian actuality is not possibility, but mere existence. So as Pippin really pithily puts it in Realm of Shadows, everything exists, but not everything is actual. So Hegel's next move is to determine the idea by opposing it to mere existence by a simple negation. So what the idea is not, at least in its immediacy, what it is distinct from uh, is indifference and externality. So we have that quote there. The idea is the rational in the sense is unconditioned because only that which has conditions essentially refers to an objectivity that does not determine itself, but which stands over in the form of it, against in the form of indifference and externality. Oops. Right. So we have here, again, what I was suggesting might be the normative distinction in Hegel's thinking as such, that between objects in det uh, determined in accordance with their own concept and thus self-determining in the sense that their principle of determination belongs to or is proper to them in some way, and thus unconditioned in the sense that they're not conditioned by another external object. That for Hegel is normative and what's defective over against that norm is objects determined or conditioned through an external and different other. Um, and in different externality by this state of the logic, when he's introducing the idea, he just takes that to characterize the finite or sometimes just reality. Okay, so finite things are finite because and to the extent that they do not possess the reality of their concept completely within them, but are in need of something else for them. So Ferrarin, I think really helpfully marks out this distinction for us and indicates its Aristotelian pedigree. Um, so, that which is actual, so substances, um, are individuated through their form, which gives them their determinacy. And uh, Ferrara wants to point out that Hegel also knows what he's calling individuation through matter, which is what constitutes accidentality and finitude for him and marks the difference between actuality and mere existence, the inadequacy of things to their concepts. So just to translate my language, 
back into Ferrarans or vice versa. Um, externally determined or indifferent objects would be Ferrarans individuation through matter, while ideally determined um, objectivity would be individuated through the activity of their concept. So Ferrarans individuation through form. Um, Karenin has a great way of elaborating this uh, relationship in terms of form tatish type, the activity of form. Anyway, in my view, this distinction, right, between different objects on the one hand and substantial or actual objects on the other, uh, needs to be emphasised because, in, in my understanding at least, it's this distinction in Hegel that inoculates him against misinterpretations, claiming that the concept somehow fully saturates or absorbs all determinacy. So versions of this claim are prominent in the continental tradition. So I'm thinking here of Derrida's less careful moments uh, and Adorno's uh, claim that Hegel's concept is a belly turned mind, you know, sucking up all difference into its machinations. Um, but one can detect versions of this critique in recent analytic literature. I'm thinking here of Robert Hanna's claim that Hegel is not a conceptualist, but he's rather a super conceptualist. I'm not going to spend any time on this misinterpretation here because I take it that um, no one at this conference is going to buy into it. The point I want to make is that if we stop here at this moment of simple opposition between the idea and indifference, um, if it's formulated as a simple negation or a bear also, as Ferrara puts it, so that there's an indifferent existence, but also al alongside it, also actuality or the idea, that would represent the idea in the form of indifference. It would reduce, um, to use the language that Hegel's using um, at the start of the idea um, section, the unconditioned to the conditioned. So, in other words, if we figure indifference in the idea is simply opposed to one another, any relationship between them would take the form of or be an instance of external imposition. Um, now, to help clarify what this kind of dualistic account would look like, Hegel predictably takes Kant to be exemplary. So, right after his immediate determination of the idea as opposed to as not indifferent externality, Hegel gives the umpteenth time in the logic alone his critique of Kant's account of the ideas of reason as unconditioned. So Kant, as you'll know, takes the faculty of reason to seek the unconditioned for any series of conditions. Uh, in both theoretical and practical spheres, the unconditioned cannot be encountered in the experience, but is rather a necessary thought we approach but do not complete the synthesis of causal conditions for an empirical object. We approach, but do not reach the moral standard articulated by practical reason. Now, what Hegel wants to say, and this is a reprisal of the structure of the finitized infinite in the being logic, um, Kant's unconditioned is in fact conditioned in the sense that it has a domain arrayed over against it, which it does not determine. So as he puts it, um, in, in the start of the idea section, Kantian unconditioned is a goal which is to be approximated, but itself always remains a kind of beyond. So the unconditioned in being figured as a beyond or as an outside to the series of conditions presents itself, Hegel thinks, as a demand to be imposed upon the conditioned, which uh, the condition cannot meet. I also think that in Hegel's mind at this point, Kant's way of figuring the relationship between intuitions and concepts, uh, concepts being imposed on bare intuitions in some ways at stake or in play. And I've got this written out, but I just don't have time to talk to it today. So in the last section of this paper, I want to provide a brief sketch of the relationship between the idea as norm and indifference as defect in a dialectical rather than a dualistic way. So I think the right way to figure the relationship is as follows. So we can't conceive of the idea as a self-standingly intelligible form in opposition to a different objectivity. It's self self-standingly intelligible. I take this formulation, self-standingly intelligible, from James Conant's beautiful paper from 2017, I think, Why Kant is Not a Kantian. But anyway, we, we need an account that understands indifference as a logical moment of the idea. And conversely, that the conceptual adequation that is constituted of the idea, we need to be able to recognize that or articulate that as a logical moment of indifference. 
So in other words, to put this again, to coherently or consistently think the idea, to be entitled to the idea, um, we have to think indifference with it and vice versa in representing indifference, some relation between externality and self-determination is entailed. Um, oops. Now, Cronus in Reason in the World, I think very clearly supplies the first limb, right? The way in which the idea is dependent upon indifference in some way. So he seeks to demonstrate that for Hegel, indifference is a necessary condition for the realization of self-organization or self-determination. So in metaphysics, the absolute idea is the highest, the most substantial, the infinite. But the point is that not everything metaphysically depends on the absolute idea, right? For him, that would be a substance metaphysics. Everything emanates, um, can be really grounded in the idea. Rather, the only dependence relation goes the other way. The complete form of reason is a process or movement that depends for its realization on the otherwise indifferent existence of incomplete forms of reason as realizes. So again, Cronus is distinguishing Hegel's account of the idea from substance metaphysics. So we don't picture the idea. This is very much picture thinking, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. The idea is not a substantial ground from which all determinacy emanates, um, but rather names the activity of self-determination dependent for its realization on indifferent material. So just to get a sense of this, I mean, self-determination is clearly dependent on indifference um, in the teleology chapter. So purposive action is dependent for its realization on taking up an indifferent objectivity as a means. Um, which you might say, well, look, that's in the objectivity uh, section. But in the sphere of the idea proper, the most obvious example of this life, right, the living being. In life, we have sublated the opposition between means and ends, right, insofar as the means for the survival of the animal, its body is itself its ends, right? The preservation of its body is its ends and also the means to achieve. Um, nonetheless, life is dependent obviously on mechanical and chemical processes that are burdened with indifference. And this, the, the fact, and this is what Cronus is, is drawing out, um, the fact that indifference is a logical moment of self-determination explains why indifference sometimes has a positive valence in Hegel's real philosophy. This is a complication I left out when introducing Hegel's indifference critique in introduction. So we can see an example of this in Hegel's account of habit in the Encyclopedia of Philosophy of Spirit, where Hegel makes what he calls mechanical habit a necessary moment of self-determination. So through habit, we become indifferent to certain differences in order to realize our purposes. So the example I usually use is we don't notice our fingers on the keyboard. We don't notice that we're using one keyboard rather than another. So the, the instrument, the means is replaceable in some way when we are properly or actually writing philosophy. Right? Um, what I wanna do now, I've got a couple of minutes left, is briefly suggest a sketch of the second limb, right? So, that which is characterized by Hegel as indifferent and opposed to the idea, characteristically mechanism, is not a brute or a bare indifference on which conceptuality or conceptual adequation is imposed, but rather a deficient form of the relationship between conceptuality and objectivity. Because if it were the case for Hegel, right, rather than the determinism that he's critiquing, that mechanistic objectivity in its immediacy is conceptless. And Kreider sometimes puts it this way, you know, at the start of the mechanism chapter, we have conceptless mechanism. Then that would make the movement from mechanism to method, so from the, the, the trajectory from objectivity through the idea, it would make that the movement from a bare, non-conceptual content that increasingly gets worked up by conceptual activity into the adequation characteristic of the idea. So it would be a kind of developmental version of just the kind of impositionism that Hegel is critical of in Kant's account of reason. So I think we can find the outline of this second limb in the following passage. Um, I'll just skip down to that the idea has not perfectly fashioned their reality, that it has not completely subjugated it to the concept, 
The possibility of that rests on the fact that the idea itself has a restricted content that as essentially as it is the unity of concept and reality, just as essentially is it also their difference. Now I take this restricted content, which Hegel's italicized here to mean as above, that while everything determinate can be said to exist, in a specific sense developed in the logic, not all existences meet the idea's criterion of concept object, concept reality, ad equation. But what's crucial to my purposes here is that Hegel's characterization of relations of relativity as not completely uh, is that he says they're not completely subjugated to the concept uh, in the way characteristic of the idea. So what this means is that there's never a purely non-conceptual content upon which conceptuality operates. Um, the language of subjugation is very interesting um, because it implies violence, but I, I won't go into that. Now, Hegel, at, at the start of the mechanism chapter, does make it sound as if mechanism is completely opposed to the idea. So just before the quote I began this talk with, Hegel says that indeterminism nowhere is a principle of determination to be found. But I think that Hegel here is talking about a deterministic standpoint that incoherently or illegitimately universalizes mechanical relationships and not at all his own dialectical position. Hegel's point in the logic is rather that there is nowhere a purely indifferent mechanism to be found. Um, that we're entitled to a mechanistic conception of objectivity, which is legitimate in its own domain, only if we avail ourselves of a moment of self-determination. So firstly, and you might think that this argument is a little too quick, perhaps too sophistical, but the self-identity and mutual exclusion of mechanical objects already presupposes a minimal moment of self-determination in, in the following way. So mechanical objects are determined by another, they're not determined through themselves, but these others through which they are determined are qualitatively identical to themselves. So in representing the purest case of indifferent external determination and objectivity, we must also necessarily represent, however minimally or thinly, self-determination, because the other that's doing the determining is, at this level of abstraction, identical. Secondly, I know I've run out of time, this is, I've got maybe a minute to go. Um, the intelligibility of mechanical objects in general is dependent upon a moment of self-organization, right? so orbit around a central body. So the second quote there, the unessential single bodies relate to one another by impact and pressure. This kind of relationship does not hold between the central body and the objects for which it is the essence. So it's the sun and the planets going around it. For their externality no longer constitutes their fundamental determination. So this temporal language, right, no longer, might make it sound as if we've moved from a, concept, a, a conceptless indifferent domain right, to a minimally conceptual determinant one in which we can qualitatively distinguish between the essential object at the center and the inessential objects in orbit. Um, but we're not in the logic dealing, no, this is the logic 101, with the order of time, right? That's the philosophy of nature, um, but rather the order of explanation. It's arguably the philosophy of nature, but rather we're in the order of explanation. So the no longer here means that our representation or explanation of mechanical objects turns out to not be entitled to an account of mechanical objects in which externality would be fundamental. So the initial picture of mecha uh, mechanistic objects comes to be intelligible now as a defect within a domain organized around a moment of self-organization, that is to say, planets in orbit. So rather than a purely defective domain over against the idea, we have within mechanism a distinction between objects determined by the indifferent impact of what he's calling their impact and pressure and objects in orbital relations, right? normative, for the mechanical domain, right? And we can only render the former de defective instance intelligible. We can only understand why um, mechanistic objects outside of this relation are, are indeterminate by reference to that moment of self-organization. Okay, so just to conclude, and this is why I think that the whole point of the talk is very obvious in fact, at a very general level, the picture I think Hegel is trying to draw in the objectivity and idea sections is not of a non-conceptual content, so you know, pure or bare indifference that comes to be adequately or fully conceptually organized, but rather between defective, so more or less indifferent relations between conceptuality and non-conceptuality and the normative or ideal relationship between conceptuality and non-conceptuality.
So in other words, the idea names not the relationship between concept and objectivity, but the right kind of relationship between concept and, ob and objectivity. And Hegel's claim, I think, is that the objectivity of idea sections exhaust the possible forms of that relationship. So the relationship between indifference and idea is not a relationship between terms, but a relationship between terms always already in relationship. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dean. That was, that was great. So our next uh, speaker is Chris. Uh, yes. Uh, our next speaker is Helias Pokni. Helias is a final year PhD candidate at the University of Warwick. His thesis attempts to give a new account for the, a new account for the move from the logic into nature, it was to submit soon. And the title of his paper uh, today, is it still current? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The title of his paper is Chemism, an Alternative to the Mechanism Teleology Dichotomy. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, June, thank you very much. Yeah, 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 it's still yeah. on. It's okay. still on. Uh, June, thank you very much for your paper. It was really, really interesting. And thank you, everyone, for being here. So today I want to talk about chemism and to suggest how a specifically chemistic account of object relations might look. The most obvious thing to do would be to explain how chemistry is not reducible to mechanistic conceptions of the world. So chemistry is a natural science. Uh, and it is typical in the secondary literature to engage with chemism as providing an account of the ontological relations between elements in the chemical experiments at least with respect to chemistry and Hegel's time. And uh, this approach is clearly justified by the myriad references to chemistry in the chapter and has been largely confirmed, again, with respect to chemistry of Hegel's time by the work of John Burbage in Real Process. I, however, lack the requisite knowledge of chemistry to argue for the non-reducibility of chemistry. Nevertheless, Hegel rather helpfully, and in a moment that is uncharacteristic for its clear delineation of what he thinks falls within the sphere of chemism from the empirical world, writes that love is exemplary of a chemical relation. What I hope to achieve in this talk is to provide a brief examination of a part of chemism, highlight some of the key logical elements of chemism, and to show what a chemical account of love, in contrast to a mechanical and teleological account of love, might look like. Thus, I seek to carve out a space for a chemistic focused account of objects with a particular focus on agents in love as my objects of, of inquiry. In everyday life, we talk about falling in love as something that happens to us or as something which we have no control over. Falling in love is a magical moment where two agents are inexplicably drawn to one another. This is like the romanticist conception of love. Right? Falling in love is something that happens to you there is no explanation for why you have suddenly become infatuated with someone, and it is granted truth and necessity by virtue of meeting these conditions. Now, looking towards he looking to Hegel, we might individuate two other explanations for falling in love. A mechanistic one, where lower level relations of particles, let's say, cause high level phenomena, like falling in love, and a teleological one, where an agent has fallen in love with someone for reasons that they can provide as justifying their love. Um, so if we were to properly appreciate an account of chemical love, we must first have an idea of competing models of love. So I'm going to start off by giving a brief sketch of what a mechanistic or a teleological account of love might look like. So mechanistic love. In mechanism, as Jean has already outlined very well, the mechanical objects are immediately identical, indifferent, and external to each other. Thus, despite the fact that mechanical objects are related to each other, their relation is one in which the respective determinations of the objects are not a part of their relation, that relation, or rather, since their respective determinations are that of the media identity, there is nothing distinctive about each, ob each object in the explanation for why they are related to each other. So a little example, it is common nowadays to explain the phenomenon of love in evolutionary terms, right? So I fall in love with someone not because of any reasons that I can give, but instead, according to evolutionary theory, it's because of unconscious motivations that are a result of the random mutations brought about by natural selection. 
So this conception of love is mechanistic because the particular determinations of the people, uh, what we think, what we feel, do not form a part of the explanation for why they are in love. Rather, they are in love for reasons that are external and indifferent to the agents involved. Teleological love. In teleology, again, very briefly, we have the subjective end that seeks to posit its determination in the objectivity confronting it. The activity of the subjective end is a self-determination and it posits objectivity as a moment of its own self-determination with the aim of imbuing it with its determination and to make it identical with itself. So in teleological love, the agent can give reasons for why they are in love with someone which express their intention. Thus, on a teleological account, someone is in love with someone because they find them very intelligent and they enjoy having stimulating conversations or because they like the same music and have taken that as a sign that they would be a good match. In either case, the agent is following a course of action that they believe will result in love because of reasons that they can feel. Our account of chemistic love is importantly different. According to chemism, chemical objects are already in a relation to each other, presupposed, because of their shared universal determinants or respective inner concept. In this talk, I'm going to interpret inner concept or the inner concept of each chemical object as pertaining to the personality or character of the agent universal determinantness in a concept. Thus, when we speak of the shared universal determinantness of the chemical objects, we are stating that the agents involved have personalities or characters that share in the same determinants. Crucially, this does not mean that agents are victims of their characters. The agents are drawn to each other because of shared aspects of their characters, which are expressions of who they are as self-determining agents. That said, one should not overemphasize the self-determining character of the chemical object either. Chemism is still within objectivity, and a central characteristic of objectivity is that the concept is not in and for itself united with externality, but is external to it. Thus, as we will see, the self-determination of the chemical object is contradicted by its own moment of individuality that has a distinct determination to the inner determination of the concept. Therefore, despite the affinity in the agent's characters, there are external circumstances that are peculiar to their individual situations that are not compatible with it and hinder their unification. In what follows, I will give an exegesis of the opening paragraphs of chemism and tease out the peculiar determinations of chemism that I've only briefly alluded to above. I will occasionally use examples from Goethe's novella, Elective Affinities, to illustrate the purely logical developments. And I use a novel because I think Hegel is probably thinking about it when he's working at chapter. So, the chemical object. Our examination of chemism begins with the chemical object. Whereas the mechanical object is conceptualized as indifferent to the determination of another mechanical object and therefore independent from it, in a sense, the chemical object is conceptualized as being essentially in a relation to another. There are two moments to the chemical object that we must clarify. First, the chemical object is essentially a determinedness. In other words, a relation to another, and it is implicitly or one-sidedly a totality. So each chemical object is itself a concept. Together, make a totality. The unification of a chemical object with its other would be the unification of their respective one-sided concepts. Accordingly, they have the urge to sublate their respective moments of individuality and unify. So far, then, the chemical objects are merely related to each other, but they have not yet posited and sublated their individuality, the other side of the chemical object. <coughs> they are still fundamentally objects and so have an external existence that is distinct from their concept. We might clarify this tension by giving uh, a little example. So, Edouard and Ottilie, the two, one or two characters from Electric Affinities, have the desire to be together or the urge to unite their respective one sided concept. And this is their universal determinedness. On the one hand, they are drawn to each other because of their shared universal determinantness. The best example, for me at least, being perhaps the scene of their duet, where Ottilie's piano playing harmonizes with Edouard's amateurish flute playing, which is significant in the fact that Edouard had previously failed to be a good partner to Charlotte, his wife. On the other hand, there, so their individual determination, they cannot be together because Edouard is married to Charlotte and because Ottilie is Charlotte's best friend. So these are the individual determinations. It's something that they do not share. It is peculiar to Edouard's situation that he is married to Charlotte 
and that his marriage with her is a hindrance to the realization of his inner contact with Ottilie, and the same goes for Ottilie. To recapitulate then, the chemical object is both the inner urge to unite with another chemical object, towards which it relates to as a matter of its basic determination, and the moment of externality to this inner urge that is a distinct determinant to it, and which is an obstacle to it. I will now uh, skip ahead to the beginning of uh, section B, the chemical process, where the irreducibility of this tension that we have just described is acknowledged and developed. Each chemical object is itself the contradiction between its urge to unite with the other chemical object and its individual determinants to remain external and distinct to its universal determinants. To return to our example from Goethe, it is a contradiction for Ottilie to be to both be in love with Edward and to be Charlotte's best friend. These two determinations are clearly incompatible and they both reside in the object or the agent Ottilie. However, this contradiction does not result in a stalemate, at least within the logic. Rather, since the universal determinants of each chemical object is the concept in itself, it is the side that has the urge to sublate the individual determination and not the other way around. Thus, the chemical objects have the urge to sublate their own externality, which has the equal consequence that they have the urge to sublate each other, for they are both implicitly the concept. And this is what Hegel calls affinity, the vansha. In affinity, the chemical objects are posited as self-contradictory. They are, on the one hand, the urge to sublate their externality and to unify under their universal determinants. On the other hand, they are also external individual objects, whose determinants is to remain external to any unification. The moment of individuality or externality Hegel calls Osagebat. And it is because of their individual determination that the chemical objects do not immediately sublate their externality and unite. So, you know, if it was just two concepts, they would just, you know, become in and for itself. But they have that important moment of individuality that is not yet in and for itself concept. And that's why it's an object relation and not uh, an idea relation. Yeah. To return to Goethe, I mean, to clarify this distinction, if we take as our chemical objects, Edouard and Ottilie, and recall that their love is a moment of their shared one-sided universal determinants, then it is quite clear how each character has affinity. They are each self-contradictory since, de since their determinations are fundamentally incompatible. The moments are held apart by the characters themselves who are unable to consummate their love on the one side and unable to renounce their love and commit to their individual determinations on the other side. The result of affinity is a merely formal unification of the chemical objects. Since their individual determination is external to their universal determination, or in other words, since their moment of externality is not in and for itself united with the concept, the chemical objects are in a unity only insofar as they have a shared universal determinants. The chemical objects are united by a third element, and that's, that's their, their shared concept, which acts as a point of mediation between the self-contradictory objects. In this formal unity, the chemical objects are no longer in a self-contradiction since the reason for their self-contradiction has been extinguished, or allusion, to use Hegel's more elemental language. The tension is extinguished because both determinations of the chemical objects have been formally accommodated. Formally accommodated. They are united and they retain them, but they also retain their externality because they are only united formally. To clarify, their merely formal unification maintains their externality since they are uni unified externally via their shared concept, whilst also expressing the urge of the concept to be united. In this formal unity, the chemical objects are, strictly speaking, no longer chemical objects, but neutral products, because they no longer relate to each other in the way that is necessary for an object, if it is to be a chemical object. So let us now take a, a look at what we have sort of uh, gathered and consider in more depth the distinctive ontological flavor that we can gain by conceptualizing, conceptualizing love in chemical terms. I think the most significant terms are the following. One, that what it is for an object to be chemical is for it to uh, relate to another chemical object, so it doesn't sort of go out and posit another object into, as in teleology, when it doesn't sort of uh, blindly relate to another object as in chemism, but uh, it's kind of a combination of the two. The relation uh, to the relation of the chemical objects or their affinity is simultaneously the universal determinants of both. So again, unlike in chemism, where the particular determinations of the objects are not actually relevant to the relation of the mechanical objects, 
in Kemsen, it is relevant. And because of that, there is an element of self-determination to be found in Kemsen that is not to be found in mechanism and is perhaps to be found too much in teleology. teleology. Let us return to our examples of Edouard and Othelie, and let us conceptualize their love in first mechanical and then theological terms. A mechanistic reading of their love might just be of the purely deterministic kind, such that they fell in love because of the particular configuration of the quantum realm, or because of a mechanistic count of the evolutionary kind, such as Edouard fell in love with Ottilie because she is much younger than Charlotte, and so a better name. A theological account might go something like this. Ottilie finds that Edouard appreciates aspects of her personality that others normally do not, and that despite the fact that he's already married to Charlotte, that he would make a very suitable husband for her. Ottilie's love for Edouard can be expressed in clear intentions that she can give. Both of these accounts are reasonable explanations for why two people might fall in love, and indeed, I think that there is room in Hegel's ontology to claim that there are mechanistic and teleological loves. However, I think that Hegel would argue that a love that is brought about by these ontological relations is not properly in accordance with the concept of love. For Hegel, love is conceptually expressed by the chemical object that is already in a relation to another chemical object. Thus, Edouard and Othelie are in love because of the culmination of their respective characters, which are the result of their activities as free agents and are both one side of the same universe of determinedness. Note that on this account, love is not entirely explicable by the free, entirely explicable by the free rational activity of the agent, since neither Edouard nor Ottilie developed in the way that they did with the intention of falling in love, but nor is it directed by lower level or unconscious forces that cause love for reasons that are indifferent to the particular determinations of the agents involved. If we uh, ignore chemism, then we can only understand human relations as either bound up by blind external actions or as the expression of purely purposive activity, at least uh, in Hegel's logic. If we follow Hegel's account of chemism, however, we can carve out a space for mystic love where an agent is falling in love because of certain intrinsic aspects that are fundamental to who they are. To put it in more concrete terms, there are necessary reasons why people fall in love that are not reducible to either mechanistic or theological ones. Rather, as Hegel's account of chemism shows, agents might fall in love because of their shared aspects of the character, which are expressions of their being as free agents. How their love turns out is a matter that Hegel leaves to each individual to resolve privately. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Okay, so we now open up for, uh, for questions uh, for both speakers. Just uh, raise your hands on, on Zoom if you have a question or um, and that's here as well. Um, okay. Yeah, please. Uh, good. Well, thank you to both of you. Uh, hello, Jean. It's been a while since I've seen you, um, but it's good to see you again. Um, right. I've got a question, for, a couple of questions, I guess. Well, two for uh, Jean, one for, for Achilles. Um, uh, the first point, actually, to Jean is... is is just um, a suggestion, and it wasn't directly relevant to the bulk of your paper, but you did highlight it at the beginning, uh, and that just is to note that um, uh, indifference in the sense of Gleichgültigkeit and indifference in the sense of indifference are significantly different. Um, and so one's going to be a little bit wary about drawing Schelling into this debate. Um, I mean, one of the distinctive features of indifference at the end of the logic of measure is that it generates, but then also undermines its own differences. So it is indifference. It, it's, it, it requires a difference that it negates. Um, but this is a little bit different from, from Gleichgültigkeit. I'm, I'm, you know, that's not directly relevant. It's worth pointing out. Um, uh, the question I had for you, um, because I liked uh, very much and agreed with a lot of what you said, is just related to one point you made at the end, which worried me a little bit. Um, and that is when you were talking about the relationship between um, what I think you call some def defective mechanism and uh, the more self-determining form of mechanism uh, that you find in, um, 
the uh, anticipation of the solar system, the sort of this, this orbiting around a center. And if I understood you right, you said that these earlier defective mechanical objects um, become intelligible by reference to the latter, um, the orbiting ones. And it's just struck me that in, I can see what you're getting at because ultimately the story will have to be that um, abstractly mechanical objects are only moments of that system. But in another sense, what you said worried me because the intelligibility can't be sort of rückwirkend in that way. It can't, can't sort of be retrospective. The intelligibility has got to be, if it's going to be imminent, it's got to reside within uh, those defective ones uh, to begin with. Um, otherwise, you're losing the imminence of the development. So I just wanted you to clarify exactly what you meant by that. It seems to me that, yes, you know, it's true of the whole logic, that, that once we get to the end, we see that the earlier stages are moments of the idea. But that doesn't mean to say they become intelligible only insofar as they are moments. The idea is precisely intelligible through the imminent development uh, of the earlier categories. So uh, if you could say a little bit about that. Um, and then to Achilleus, um, again, I very much enjoyed what you had to say. Um, my concern is slightly to do with how far you can go, even with chemism in the understanding of love. Um, and in the philosophy of right, which is one of the places where Hegel talks about love, he is very keen to point out that love is this moment of finding oneself in the other, uh, you know, losing oneself and then finding oneself in, in, uh, in the other. Um, whereas what you get with chemism, as I understand it, in the chemical process, is the two chemicals coming together and, and forming a, a neutrality. Now, a neutrality seems an odd kind of term through which to understand um, the union of two people in love. I'm sure I'm, I, you weren't necessarily suggesting that chemism is, is, uh, uh, provides an exhaustive understanding of love, but I wondered if you want to say a little bit about perhaps how even chemism um, uh, is not able to un, uh, account for uh, love as, as Hegel understands it. All right, thank you. Uh, Jim, would you like to go first? Sure. Uh, thanks very much, Stephen. That's, um, I take the point about in, indifference, uh, indifference and like um, uh Just with the, with the second question, you're, you're right. And um, I did kind of fudge things there. Uh, the point I wanted to make was that rather than figuring um, you know, a, a norm and a, and a defect across these sections, we, we have to see that this norm and defect relationship is operative within each of these sections. So that at the end of the um, mechanism chapter, we're able to see exactly why it is or how it is. But, but already I'm shading into the same, okay, well, we only understand um, mechanism in the sense that mechanism is only intelligible um, once we get to absolute mechanism at the end of the chapter. And I guess I'm not, like all I can say in response to your question is I guess I'm not entitled to make that claim. So thanks for that, um, uh, that point. It's just a, what I want to draw out is that we, perhaps what becomes intelligible is, that, is why it is that these um, mechanism in its immediacy isn't fully intelligible. That's the, this is definitely out of crimes, right? Like, each of these moments um, sort of fails the test of full intelligibility in some way and only the idea fully satisfies them. So maybe I could nuance the point or get around the point um, by saying that it's at the end of the mechanism chapter that we're able to see the limits of intelligibility in, in mechanism yes, immediacy. Uh, I understand that. I mean, James is not here to defend himself, so it's not perhaps fair. Um, I mean, my concern about his perspective <laughs> is that he makes reference, you know, to explanatory power, which is, you know, explanation. I don't think the logic is about explanation. Um, um, I mean, there is a sense in which you're right that, that uh, indifference um, uh, compared to 
what Achilleus was describing in, in chemism doesn't have a sort of an internal moment that um, explains, in inverted commas, um, the determinacies that belong to that thing or the process it engages in. But of course, externality is just a different kind of, of, of relation. Uh, it is perfectly intelligible within itself. Um, yeah. I mean, every category in that sense, if, if we're to believe Hegel anyway, yeah. is perfectly intelligible within itself. It has its own dynamic and it leads us on to something else. Now, what is true is that it's only later in the development that we understand precisely what it means for an earlier one to be a moment of a later one. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> you know, that's yeah. true. But I think one's got to be a little bit careful if by saying that, that the earlier moments become intelligible or more intelligible later, um, unless you want to give up on imminence. Now, that's obviously an, an option for you. Not everybody likes the idea that the <laughs> development is imminent. But if it's going to be imminent, it can't be that the intelligibility becomes later. That no, comes later. That, that's all I would, would, would say. I don't know if you want to come back on that. No, no that's really helpful. Thanks, thanks very much. Good, good. Well, thank you. Okay. Uh, Achilles, have you got that? Yeah, thank you for the question. So, yeah, I mean, on the one hand, your question reflects just the general difficulty of using examples, I think. <laughs> uh, so, uh, as I, I mentioned briefly, you know, in the moment of affinity in, chemical, in the chemical process, uh, it's logically necessary that the, that the objects will develop in a certain way, but I don't think we can say the same thing for sort of everyday life uh, and you're right i'm not trying to give an exhaustive account of hegel's concept of love and i would suspect that that would be found in either the philosophy of spirit or the philosophy of right uh, one thing i would say though is that the way you describe love uh, as finding oneself in the other uh, does sound not too dissimilar to the shared universal determinants of the chemical objects and their essential relation to one another. Um, there, you can see how there are some logical similarities in that uh, they are others, they're related to another, but they share an identity and that identity is a universal determination. And so there is a sort of finding of oneself there. Um, I don't know if you find that convincing. Well, if I just, I, mean, I guess what worries me slightly, I'm just looking at the passage now in, in, in Chemical Process, yeah. where he talks about a, a, a tension and a spannung that is then, uh, then um, gives way to a calm neutrality. Mm. Now, it doesn't take much imagination to, to think of, of analogues of that in, in, in the realms of love. But one might say, well, that's just one aspect of what love is. Um, and so chemism... I mean, to think of a love relationship as essentially about relieving tension uh, and leading to a neutrality between the two does seem a little bit reductive. That's, I mean, it's kind of like, <laughs> that's all that I'm a little bit worried about. Um, <laughs> so okay. Into too much detail early this early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> if I can make one suggestion, and I, again, I, I am very uh, aware of the dangers of just uh, running with empirical examples. Uh, but one way of thinking of the formal unity, and again, if we take an example from the, the, the elective affinities, in around the middle section of the novel, uh, once all the characters have declared their love, they sort of all separate. They all go, like, uh, Edouard goes to a cottage in the middle of nowhere, separate from Otley, then he goes to war to sort of, I guess, relieve his tensions. <laughs> uh, but uh, the characters are still in love. Uh, they are still in love but they're separate from each other. And you might say that they are just formally in love because they haven't actually, they're not actually properly unified uh, as we might get later on in a more developed moment of chemism. So, I mean, that's one way that you might think about a formal unity where uh, you are sort of still connected to each other from, by a kind of determination, but you haven't, you're not you know, in and for itself or in and for yourself united. Um, but, and again, it's just uh, trading in examples, and uh, I'm not sure if that's a great way. But yes, I, okay. if anything, I would, I would just want to say something like uh, chemism offers a nice uh, ontological account for what's going on in love, but it doesn't exhaust all the determinations of empirical love. Like Good. Thanks. Thanks a lot to both of you. Thank you.
Yeah, our next question comes from Macam. Yeah, thanks. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot to both of you for the talks. I enjoyed them a lot. Um, I have a question for each of them. So um, I would first maybe ask a question to Jean. Um, so I wondered if you would agree with, um, well, let's say, I wondered about your talk about efficiency in mechanism. Maybe that's a little bit related to the question, to the first question, but. Um, uh, like, would you say that mechanical objects are deficient as mechanical objects, or are mechanical explanations deficient if we want to use them um, for explaining like all aspects of reality? I would say that's different because then mechanical objects, um, like they are not deficient as mechanical objects because that's like being determined from external reality, it's just the way they are. Was this clear? I don't know. Yes, yeah, so I agree. Sorry, I, it, I can't hear as, as well as I'd like, but I, I agree entirely. And if I had more time, I'd want to um, set that out more clearly that Hegel is here um, elaborating, I'm going to use the word explanation, but um, Stephen understandably is, is skeptical of, um, but you know, providing explanatory paradigms that have real purchase on objective domains. Uh, that's, uh, so in that sense, mechanism isn't deficient. All I was trying to counter is the idea that there's just an a deficiency as such over against a um, some normative instantiation, so that we can um, with within mechanism we can pick out more or less um, adequate yeah. um, relations between concept and objectivity. Okay. Uh, so but that's a really good point. I should really um, foreground that um, when I when I write this up. Okay, yeah, thanks. That's it. So, yeah. No, thank you. Thanks. And um, yeah, to Achilles. Um, so you wanted to make your case that chemistry is not reducible to, to the mechanistic world by, by like, that's what you said at the beginning, but I was just wondering if it, you wouldn't make a stronger case if you say like something like according to Hegel, there is no mechanistic account and teleological account of love. That's just a chemical one. So <laughs> the questions maybe go a little bit in the other direction from uh, the question from uh, Professor Hulgate. But I was just wondering, I mean, I think Hegel does just talk about love with respect to chemistry, at least when it comes to objectivity yeah. in the sense of logic. And then you could make the case saying something like, okay, a mechanistic picture of love isn't really love because the person is somehow determined by external factors. And a teleological account of love isn't really love because it's an artistic person. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I mean, um, that would make you wouldn't yeah. make a stronger case, right? Of course. So as you as you said, it would be a stronger case, but one that I wouldn't have been able to substantiate in the school. Okay. So I don't want to make that necessarily. Uh, secondly, um, I I have this uh, idea of uh, so I guess part of the book. Yeah. So I wonder whether. There are different ways that you can uh, describe things, but only well, one of them is the right way to describe things. Or, or maybe even there are lots of ways that things can happen, but there's the one way when it's sort of the, the sort of the proper concept of the thing that is happening. So I don't know, maybe some people do fall in love because of evolutionary reasons. Um, or maybe, I don't know, maybe they don't, but uh, <laughs> uh, I think what, what we can say is that. Hegel would say that when it comes to sort of the concept of love, as we humans sort of like to think about it, conceptualize about it, like that process is not in proper accordance with the concept. But I mean, they still feel in love, even if it's because of natural selection, and they think they're in love. Um, so yeah, I can see how there are also yeah issues surrounding it. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, our next question comes from Edmund. I continue the questions on love. I'm going to assume, thank you, that by love you don't mean um, an ontological existent, uh, real, the real true nature of love as a definite category. You're using the word in its natural language sense as a family resemblance concept. And I think you've described a really good match for lots of uh, romantic pairings mostly in literary contexts. This would match some Sheridan plays, it would match quite a lot of reference. 
Um, I wonder if you could expand this account using a bit more Hegel. So I noticed that chemical process, after reaching this uh, neutrality, nevertheless retains the tension of the accomplished or pseudo-accomplished unity and the, in, the externality of the individuals. They're still physical individuals. Um, but in so doing, it returns to its concept and passes over into external purposiveness. Could we infer from that, that in these literary contexts you're thinking about, such couples, if they attain, if they get what they want, they get their unity, they're more likely, the relationship will go forwards narratively if there's an external purpose to which they jointly direct themselves and stagnate otherwise. Uh, would that be a, an interesting line of thought? I'm not sure, because I think that, so, uh, interesting question, thank you very much. That presupposes, I think, that the development of logic is the development of things in everyday life, right? So all chemical relations necessarily have to develop in biological relations. Is that what that question presupposes, do you think? Um, assuming that you're allowed to select for all and only those natural language select um, in reference of love mm -hmm. that match the logic of chemical process and assuming that all things that exactly match the structure of chemical process follow the structure of the logic. I think that's a reasonable claim. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think that's... Uh... I mean, yeah, I mean, if, if chemical process is Hegel's concept of love, then things would go better in that respect, if they were developing from chemism. But become more complex. More complex, like that, mm -hmm. yes. Um, but I mean, it's, it's, de it's definitely a direction that I should think about, mm. but not something that I thought about. Darling, thank you. Thank you. Okay, my next question comes from Professor Lowe. I thought that in the logic, um, the concepts developed their figure as ways of thinking, ways of comprehending. It's not part of the logic to, uh, um, to consider them as, uh, or in the way in which they could constitute, in which they could constitute themselves as a, as a science, as a, Real, um, um, as they are considered in the real philosophy. So all these forms of thought can be applied. And I mean, the logic's interest is in comprehending them as forms of thought. They can be applied anywhere. It's, um, I can have a mechanical conception of uh, human society and I can comprehend certain social philosophies, having read the logic in this way, seeing that they indeed, in fact, uh, think of human society and of the, the form of totality that it is uh, in terms of the form of thought that is, that is called mechanism. Um, it's no surprise then that, for example, love may be thought in all manner of ways, mechanically, chemically, teleologically. This, and it, it, um, we can, of course, try to um, deepen our grasp of what chemism is by going through um, the exercise of thinking out what it would be and what it is to think of love chemically. Uh, but this is the way in which it elucidates, not that we know anything about love and then, oh, uh, yeah, okay, that's, um, the elective affinities are themselves a way, are this kind of exercise. Mm -hmm. And this is how Hegel understands it. Uh, and the elective affinities end in disaster. <laughs> uh, so I, I think the point is, uh, yeah, of course, no. You can think of love through the form of thought that is chemism. Okay, then, 
that would be a disaster. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, that, so that, that, that's, how, that's how I would understand it. I don't really think of it as an, ex I mean, you use the term empirical example. Sure. And I'm not sure how, uh, whether this term is completely fortunate. Okay. I mean, is it empirical? I mean, if I consider, for example, the Hobbes social philosophy, I could say a bit that it's mechanistic. Now, is that an empirical example? Well, no, because I mean, human society is not a mechanistic totality. Uh, I, 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 anyway, so yeah, do you see what I, I no, do, I'm yeah. just. So yeah, uh, there are a lot of points there. So one thing I think is that I do not think that the logic is just about the categories of things. And that these are so. Uh, in what respect do you say that they're distinct from the real philosophy? In what respect are they distinct? Are they, do they are they are they purely a methodological precursor? Or well, I would have liked to hear you on yeah, your sure, uh, dissertation yeah. project. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, and it's it's that, that's very difficult, and I'm not in a position now to sure. um, sort of improvise on it. Uh, but I was thinking that in, in real philosophy, there is laid out a way in which a certain form of thinking can constitute itself as science mm -hmm. um, through a certain system of concepts that will be definite and will not be logical themselves. Um, physics, for example. And chemistry. These all I wouldn't think of them as domains, as you once used this term. But this is not a criticism. But just um, when I try to understand clearly what it is, perhaps I'm hindered by speaking of it as domains because it seems as though it's circumscribable. Yes, and sure. and that I think is not quite right. There's I mean, the science of physics applies indeed to everything. Mm -hmm. It's not circumscribed. I I think anyway. Anyway, so yeah. that's considered as a science. Um, and it's absolute knowledge insofar as it is science. But in um, the logic, it appears as well as the, as, yeah, the development of the idea. And I don't know, so you, yeah. should, you should tell me yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, about, uh, you should answer your question. <laughs> uh, it's gonna get you. Uh, so, um, so yeah, let me go with the, let me, let me answer what you were concerned about empirical examples. So, If Hegel's logic is a development of thought, then the idea would be that he's going to use uh, words, categories, forms of thought that are as unbound by particular content as possible, right? So he's not going to, we're not going to find the category of this auditorium in the logic. So I guess in that respect, love, or a more particular example, the love described in uh, electrical affinities is something that doesn't really belong in the domain of the logic. So in that respect, it's different, mm -hmm. it's inappropriate. Right? Yeah. Now, I don't think that that means that the logic is distinct from the real world. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's just a methodological precursor. I think that and I think uh, sublation is really important here. It's that when we go into nature, uh, it's the whole of logic that is being carried into nature. And you have this wealth of conceptual material that is gonna play a fundamental role, one way or another, in the development of nature spirit. So I think in that respect, you can say, or you can give an account of things, or you can try to understand things uh, from the logic. Now that said, it's correct. You can give a mechanistic, theological, and you can give a mechanistic kind of society. That's perfectly reasonable. But I think if you were to follow the development of Hegel's thought, you would necessarily have to conclude that a purely mechanistic conception of society is faulty. It is not in accordance with the self-determination of the age of the individual. Uh, and so there is an idea of an adequate concept. There is an idea of an adequate uh, unity of, but there is an idea of, yeah, of, of the, the correct way of thinking about what a state is, let's say, or what love is. Um, 
No, I agree. I mean, that's why I said when you think of love chemically, what issues is disaster? Well, well I mean, that doesn't answer it. We're not, I, mean, I don't think, we're, you know, we're not trying to give a normative account of how to succeed in love. It's just describing what love is. Well, I don't think that's really distinguishable. I mean, if you, if you think that because love is as we're human, no, I don't know, it's through its own understanding, just a society. I mean, if you, it's the same. I mean, if you think of society at, um, you know, mechanistically, the result is disaster. I mean, it, it, this is itself, a, I don't know. <laughs> Okay. I don't think that I don't think that distinction you just made is um, the sound. Okay. How about this? How about that? Um, we shouldn't infer from the like Goethe's novel that a chemical reading of love when disaster because it's it's not a conceptually rigorous account of love. It's a it's a literary idea of how love might develop based on certain premises. Well, I disagree, but that's okay. That's, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, give a round of applause for. <laughs>